Now then, we'll, we'll move on with the study of the Ten Virgins. And as I said before, we'll now make our main source of information the Little Book Early Writings. There's a chapter on page 240 which is entitled The Advent Movement Illustrated, which is an inspired revelation of what took place in the proclamation of the first, second, and first and Second Angels' messages and therefore is an inspired account of the going forth of the virgins. So I turn to page 240 and um, we'll read the paragraphs and at the same time illustrate them by diagrams on the, black, on the whiteboard today. It begins by saying, I saw a number of companies that seemed to be bound together by cords. What we'll do is draw a circle on the left-hand lower side of the board and this is typical of each of the companies referred to. So, so I saw a number of them and they all seem to be bound together by cords. There's one of them. And obviously, of course, they are church companies, companies of uh, church people. Reading further, many in these companies were in total darkness. Their eyes were directed downward to the earth and there seemed to be no connection between them and Jesus. So let's draw here a few X's to, to indicate these people and their gaze was directed downwards to the earth they had no connection between themselves and Jesus they were out there in the darkness of the world but then it says but scattered through these different companies were persons whose countenances looked light and whose eyes were raised to heaven beams of light from Jesus like rays from the sun were imparted to them an angel bade me look carefully and I saw an angel watching over every one of those who had a ray of light while evil angels surrounded those who were in darkness. What we've got here is a picture of the church's condition just prior to the sounding of the first angel's message which is the very next thing we shall read about. But I'll read it for you now. The next sentence reads I heard the voice of an angel cry Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Which angel is that? The first angel, right? And he began to sound roughly about 1833, 1831. By 33, it was really beginning to, to get going. So there's a picture then of the church or the churches of Sardis as they were as the time approached for the first angel to sound his message. And the picture is that many in the churches were in total darkness, their, their eyes were directed downwards to the earth and there was no connection between them and Jesus whatsoever. While at the same time scattered through the church were individuals whose faces looked light, their, their eyes were turned upwards to heaven and at times a ray of light from Jesus came to these various individuals. Now, a very interesting point is this, that an angel was watching over everyone who had a ray of light from Jesus while evil angels surrounded those who were in darkness. Now possibly you can remember and I, I do believe you should be able to remember this that before you ever heard this message before the gospel in its purity began to sound upon your ears rays of light did come to you insights precious little openings into God's truth that you'd never seen before I remember, I remember very well for instance that back in 1954 uh, 19, before that 19, uh, about 1948-49 I was working in Sydney at the time I had not yet heard about Wagner and Jones never heard about them until about 1954 or 5 and um, the Sabbath school lesson that particular year was on the origin of sin, the fall of Adam and Eve, and then later, of course, on the flood. And I recall very distinctly seeing for the first time the fact that God does not destroy. And to me, it was a very precious and wonderful revelation of truth and came before I ever received the actual gospel of Jesus Christ. And so in the church, before the message begins to sound, we find this, these two groups of people those who have a ray of light from Jesus, those who are looking upwards, and the rest, of course, are looking downwards to the earth. And then the word says, I heard the voice of an angel say, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. So I'll use uh, red markers to indicate a message. So here now comes shining on to those fallen churches 
the light of the first angel's message back in 1831 to 1833. So here now comes the message of the first angel. And immediately things begin to happen. From that point on, I read the second paragraph there on page 240 in the book uh, early, uh, early Writings. A glorious light then rested down upon those companies to enlighten all who would receive it. Some of those who were in darkness received the light and rejoiced. So here we have a happy change. As some of these folk in darkness, their eyes were turned from being downwards and they were now turned in an upward direction to receive the light and to join in the general rejoicing with those who received it. Others resisted the light from heaven saying that he was sent to lead them astray. The light passed away from them and they were left in darkness. Those who received the light from Jesus joyfully cherished the increase of precious light which was shed upon them. Their faces beamed with holy joy while their gaze was directed upward to Jesus with intense interest and their voices were heard in harmony with the voice of the angel fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Now, coming back a moment, we find that a glorious light then rested down upon those companies to enlighten all who would receive it. So this glorious light was upon the entire company. Then goes on to say that uh, some of those in darkness received it, but others resisted it, saying it was sent to lead them astray, and were warned that they were left in darkness. And now this is permanence. That when the light of truth came to them, and they turned their backs upon that light of truth, they were left permanently in darkness, and never again did those folk receive a ray of light from Jesus which strengthens the assertion I made last night that while movements have two cores, individuals don't necessarily have two cores. Now this doesn't mean that God just gives you one core and that's the end of it. The Spirit of God works for a long time with a person and only gives up the struggle when it becomes apparent. The person has finally settled in their minds they will not accept the truth of God. Now keep in mind very, very uh, clearly though that uh, these people who turned their backs upon the message as it came to them in such brilliance and power were lost sight of, they disappeared from view and do not enter the picture again at all. Now those who do receive the message join with the angel in proclaiming that message and this generates persecution. And we'll find a very important sequence here. First the gospel preaching, the reception of that message by some, then they share in the proclamation of that truth in the power of the Spirit and this generates very, very serious persecution on the part of the rejectors of the message. So I now read, as, this is page 241, as they raised this cry, I saw those who were in darkness thrusting them with side and with shoulder. Now comes separation. Then many who cherished the sacred light broke the cords which confined them and stood out separated from those companies. As they are doing this, men belonging to the different companies and revered by them passed through, some with pleasing words and others with wrathful looks and threatening gestures and fastened the cords which were weakening. These men were constantly saying, God is with us, we stand in the light, we have the truth. I inquired who these men were and was told that they were ministers and leading men who had rejected the truth, the light themselves, and were unwilling that others should receive it. Right, now the, we'll move on in time a little bit, and here's the same company of people, down around, getting on towards 1844 now. We find that the folk in darkness were still looking down to the earth, but there had now come a physical separation from the rejectors of the message. And the true people of God, the wise, together with the foolish, that, that is the wise version, together with the foolish version, now moved out from the churches and became a separated company outside the church. But let me stress the important point. That as they went forth to meet the bridegroom, those who went forth were wise and foolish virgins. So here they are, wise and foolish virgins. Which means we have three classes. Those left in darkness one class, the wise a second class and the foolish a third class. And it seems to me that the average person studying the ten virgins overlooks the fact that there are three classes because the parable says so much about wise and foolish virgins they think in terms only of two classes but there are three distinct classes involved. 
The third class in Matthew 24 is called, they, they're called hypocrites. So there's the sequence. The gospel is preached. It uh, generates persecution and at least a physical separation from those who are exercising or executing the, the persecution. Now, this separation movement is stoutly resisted by a certain class of people back in the church organisation. As it says here, as they were doing this, doing what? Breaking the cords which confined them and standing out separate from those companies. As they were doing this, men belonging to the different companies and revered by them passed through, some with pleasing words and others with wrathful looks and threatening gestures, and fastened the cords which were weakening. When Sister White asked the question, who were these men? She was told they were ministers and leading men who had rejected the truth themselves and are doing their best to prevent others from laying hold upon it. It's, um, as, Jesus, as Jesus said, they not only stay out of, the, uh, out of the kingdom themselves, but they prevent others from going there too. In the book Desire of Ages, we have the marvellous chapter entitled Beth Esther and the Sanhedrin, which deals with the confrontation between Christ and the Jewish leaders over the Sabbath question and in this chapter we have this, this paragraph which says that um, that um, if I can just find it here which tells us that if the leaders had not interposed Christ would have wrought the greatest reformation in all human history maybe I'm mistaken in regard to the uh, chapter I thought it was but I thought it was in this chapter but there is a statement where Sister White says this that had not the priests and rabbis interposed Christ would have effected the greatest reformation in all human history and strangely enough it seems to be well it not seems but it is, it is a fact that when a church is apostatized which they do because of the nature of the minister's preaching then when the time comes that God begins to effect a reformation and calls the people back from darkness to light, it's always the leading men, the priests and ministers, who become the, the most uh, determined opposers of the truth, always. It's 205. 205, is it? Thank you. But I guess I just couldn't see it. That's right where I was looking. But there's, I, I already quoted the same anyway, but there's, there's the actual reference. Oh yes, there it is. Page 205. If the priests and rabbis had not interposed, his teaching would have wrought such a reformation as this world has never witnessed. But in order to maintain their own power, these leaders determined to break down the influence of Jesus. His arraignment before the Sanhedrin and an open condemnation of his teachings would aid in effecting this for the people still had great reverence for their religious leaders and so on now likewise back in 1844 if these men had not gone around fasting the cords which bound the people many more would have stood out and identified with the true church of God and the same of course is true today so then we now reach this point of physical separation of the part of the wise and foolish virgins. We go a little further now. I saw those who cherished the light looking up with ardent desire expecting Jesus to come and take them to himself. Soon a cloud passed over them and their faces were sorrowful. I inquired the cause of this cloud and was shown there was their disappointment. So then we move down now to the first of the two great disappointments and the first one came by the end of March 1844 and that was the first disappointment now let's see what happens in consequence of that and we learn at this point that there is a shaking in which the wise versions and the foolish versions are separated now I used to think and possibly you think too that the the wise and the foolish remain together right down to the actual great disappointment but this is not true there are two separations of the wise and the foolish outlined in this parable as I shall demonstrate in just a moment and the first one took place at the first disappointment and the second took place at the second disappointment now let's establish that at this time March 1844 there was in fact a returning of the foolish virgins back to the church from which they came we'll go back to Great Controversy a moment page 394 
and um, we will note the um, verification of this there and there's a stronger statement still in uh, early writings page about, about page 243 or 44 now in describing the difference the difference in the wise and foolish on page 394 it says in regard to the wise that they had a personal experience a faith in God and in his word which could not be overthrown by disappointment and delay whereas the foolish virgins it says when trials came their faith failed and their lights burned dim now the first great trial of course was the first disappointment and when that came their faith failed a little further down it says in this time of uncertainty nam nam namely the tarrying time and the tarrying time of course succeeds the first disappointment let me just get that on the board for you here we'll move the company along a little bit further and now we, we only have virtually wise virgins left because the foolish all go back to the church from which they came uh, at this time and then we enter into the tarrying time and in this time of uncertainty which is the tarrying time the interest of the superficial and half-hearted soon began to waver and their efforts to relax but those whose faith was based on the personal knowledge of the Bible had a rock beneath their feet which the waves of disappointment could not wash away they all slumbered and slept now listen carefully one class in unconcern and abandonment of their faith which class is that one obviously foolish the other class patiently waiting until clearer light should be given so one class abandons their faith the other class waits patiently until clearer light should be given and this is during the tarrying time which succeeds the first disappointment and lasts of course until the uh, midnight cry begins now to show to what extent the foolish versions lost their faith at this time I now turn to a later page in early writings in the next chapter entitled the Another Illustration which goes over the same ground again and gives us further in, or different information and more information on the same subject page 246 Sister White says I saw the disappointment of the trusting ones as they did not see their Lord at the expected time now anyone who takes early writings and scans the pages will recognize that this is the first and not the second disappointment in fact um, if you look at my book here I'm reading from this page page 246 over here is the second angel's message Babylon is fallen is fallen and um, over here we move on to the um, midnight cry behold the bridegroom cometh and over here finally on the next on, on page 240 and 250 we come to the actual second disappointment so there's no question about the fact that we're reading about the first disappointment I now go back to that and read from page 246 it, it had been well, in the next paragraph as the time passed those who had not fully received the light of the angel united with those who despised the message and they turned upon the disappointed ones with ridicule and here are three classes of people let's, let's list them number one those who had not fully received the light of the angel that's one class they that class you know with class number two they united with those who had despised the message there's class number two and they class one and two together turned upon the disappointed ones with ridicule now let's identify them who obviously are they who had received but not fully received the light of the angel oh, the foolish virgins now if they united with those who despised the message who were they, they were the, hypocrites. the hypocrites right and they that is the foolish virgins and the rejectors turned upon the disappointed ones with ridicule who must the disappointed ones be wise. the wise virgins so here is a picture then of the foolish rejoining the rejectors of the message and having done so they then unitedly persecute and despise those who remain faithful to God out there in total separation now this statement then proves beyond a shadow of that, that there are three classes involved and two that um, there was a shaking of separation at that point of time leaving the wise to carry on virtually alone until the midnight cry 
I come back there to page 241. I saw those who cherished the light looking upward with ardent desire, expecting Jesus to come and take them to himself. Soon a cloud passed over them and their faces were sorrowful. I inquired the cause of this cloud and was shown that it was their disappointment. The time when they expected their Saviour had passed and Jesus had not come. As discouragement settled upon the waiting ones, the ministers and leading men whom I, whom I had before noticed rejoiced and all those who rejected the light triumphed greatly while Satan and his evil angels also exulted. So there was a period of triumph, very short-lived of course, during which the ministers and leading men exulted in the embarrassment of the believers and their disappointments. What's the next event? The coming of the, of the second angel. Then I heard the voice of another angel saying, Behold, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. A light shone upon those desponding ones and with ardent desires for his appearing they again fixed their eyes upon Jesus. So then, we now come to the second angel's message at this point. And uh, it's very important that we recognise upon whom alone the light of the second angel shone. Now the first angel, as we read before on page 240, was a glorious, excuse me, was a glorious light which then rested down upon those companies to enlighten all those who would receive it. In other words, the first angel's message shone on the entire company. But the second angel, it says, a light shone upon those desponding ones. So upon whom did the second angel's light shine? Right, only on those who accepted the first. And that brings to view a very important principle here. The Bible says and the, the, that the second angel follows the first. That's not the exact words. Let's look at the exact words in Revelation chapter 14 verse 8. I think it says, And there, and there followed another angel. I think, I think it's what it actually says. Right. And there followed another angel. In other words, the second angel follows the first. And we can't reverse that order. We, sh we shouldn't want to reverse it, although we're tempted to very, very often. Very often indeed. Now the first angel brings the everlasting gospel and only those who, for the ministry of the everlasting gospel, find themselves, themselves separated from sin within are prepared to be separated from sinners without. We are married to Satan. He is our husband and the father of our wicked offspring, namely the old carnal mind. And until that marriage is broken up by the saving power of God, we belong to Satan's family and therefore we belong to Babylon. But when the marriage in ourselves is broken up, so we're no longer Satan's bride, then we are, then we are ready to leave his home. Now what is his home? Babylon. Therefore, the second angel's message must never be preached to anybody who has not received the first angel's message. When I say received it, received it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've learned this lesson over the years and learned it well. I trust I've learned it well. I remember on one occasion now in California, probably about 10 or 12 years ago now, I was in a home and the husband and wife were talking to me and these folk were really deploying the wickedness of the church. They were describing its sins, its shortcomings, its blatant errors and so forth and expressing the deepest concern about the future of the church. And I thought to myself, well, these folk are just ripe to hear Matthew 22. They, what, what they need now is, is to understand that what they're seeing is only what's been prophesied. And so I made the sad mistake of... Uh, bowed that temptation and began to give them a study on Matthew 22 and when they saw the implications of that prophecy when they saw that that prophecy declared the final rejection of the Seventh Adventist Church organization which it does we saw last night it was amazing the turnaround which those people then manifested suddenly they became defensive of the church because they could only say good things about it it was the apple of God's eye it was a treasure of truth it was going through to the end so if anyone touch it, then anyone call it Babylon and so forth. And suddenly I, instead of being 
a respected teacher was the worst possible heretic upon the face of the earth and they virtually threw me out of the house not physically of course but uh, they let me know I wasn't very welcome there anymore and of course I never got back to that place again now Jesus demonstrated the same uh, the correct awareness in dealing with Nicodemus and Sister Wise says Nicodemus came to Jesus Christ to enter into a discussion on the organization of the church that Christ was going to build he didn't think he needed to be born again that, that he felt was quite well taken care of but Jesus said to him except you be born again you cannot see the kingdom of God now I used to think that that meant he couldn't uh, ascend in, in the day of resurrection to heaven and enter, enter the pearly gates which of course it means too but in the meantime it also means that unless we are truly born again it's impossible for us to actually see the bride of Christ which is the true church of God we can't see it we look at something else and call that the church of God but never see the real church of God as being the church of God and so Christ refused to answer Nicodemus' question he said, he said instead except you be born again Nicodemus that is your need that must come first and when that is settled when you gain the personal living experience then you are prepared to see and identify the true church of God and understand its unique organizational structure and so in 1844 the Lord did not present the second angel's message to anyone except he had first of all received the first angel's message. Otherwise, God did not present it to them. And if we try and reverse the order, then we'll make a very, very sad mistake too. Now you'll find and probably have found, of course, that when a Seventh-day Adventist, and especially a Reformed Seventh-day Adventist, first meets you and learns about the fact you have a message, the first question they ask is, how are you organised? Who is your president? How big are your committees? Where is your board of management? What is your official name? And so forth. <laughs> Don't answer those questions. Not one of them. Because if you do, you're putting the cart before the horse. Tell them, as Christ told Nicodemus, you must be born again. In other words, turn their minds around to the message which we bear and say, look, before we look at those questions which you've asked, we must first of all decide what we teach because if we're teaching the truth then our organizational structure will be in harmony with that truth but if we're teaching error how we're organized is not important at all it's not important and so and, and if you find they're not prepared to talk about the gospel if they're so self-righteous they don't even they think they don't even need the gospel then forget them don't don't get embroiled in an argument about our organizational structure our official name our our and so on just forget about that point because you'll finally be fruitless and a waste of very valuable energy and even more valuable time now then we move a little further in the development of this story I now read from page 241 I saw a number of angels conversing with the one who had cried Babylon is fallen and these united with him in the cry behold the bridegroom cometh go you out to meet him the musical voices of these angels seem to reach everywhere an exceedingly bright and glorious light shone around those who had cherished the light which had been imparted to them their faces shone with excellent glory and they united with the angels in the cry behold the bridegroom cometh so this moves us down now to the midnight cry a little of which I described in the last study period when I made the point that the um, that the um, parable would be fulfilled again to the very letter so let's draw them over here now moving along at this point we have the wise virgins still out in separation and to them comes the glorious light of the midnight cry which came of course in August 1844 at the Exeter camp meeting first of all and later of course it spread throughout the length and breadth of the United States of America and I suppose Canada too let me put the second angel's message here in the right colour. Right. <clears throat> now, we'll now find that once again the same sequence is, uh, is being involved. I'll now bring the church along, still with uh, its unrepentant rejectors of the truth, as we saw before. They've been lost sight of so I shan't draw them in anymore, otherwise we might think they're still there to be seen. Now at this point there rises, there rises a very interesting question. Let me read a little bit further. 
It says in regard to those who receive the midnight cry, and once again, before I go to that next point, let's take this point first. Once again, upon whom alone at this stage shone the light of the midnight cry? The wise virgins. The separated wise virgins. They're out there in separation. I'll make a very strong point a little later, namely that this parable is a revelation to us of what God's battle plan is. Now, who is the head of the church? Christ. Who is the general of the armies of the Lord? Christ is. And who then is the decision maker as to battle strategy? Christ is, right? And when Christ reveals to us his battle strategy, what do we do? We obey it. We don't start thinking up all kinds of logic, in inverted commas, put together by human minds, human speculations, human theorising as to where we should be. And you'll often hear today the argument, well, if I don't stay back there in the Seventh Avenue Church, how can I possibly reach those poor souls that need to hear the gospel? That's a very, very common argument. Now, that is not supported by God's battle plan, which is developing here on our board today. And I'll, and I'll make this point again in more detail a little later. But just a seed thought in your minds to work in, in the meantime. So then, um, as we look back on the history of the past, if we live back there, knowing what we now know, in a lot, in a lot of what God's revealed for Sister White, where would you choose to have been if you could make the choice back at that point of time from the, from this, from the, the present viewpoint? The answer is obvious, isn't it? You, you wouldn't want to be down here with rejectors, would you? When all this lovely light is shining up here, would you? Or out there? Neither would I. I want to be where God's light is, where God would call these folk together to receive that light. Now it says, as they harmoniously raise this cry among the different companies. Now what's the point in doing that? We learned earlier that these rejectors of God's truth were lost sight of. They'd made the decision, they would never after reverse that decision. So what's the point in showing light amongst them again? The, the answer lies in the fact that there's another class of people heretofore not yet mentioned, and they are the hidden ones, the hidden wise and foolish virgins who had not yet heard and responded to the call. Now I turn to page 373 uh, three in the book Great Controversy to read about them. And this to me is an extremely comforting revelation of God's love and care for those who are in the fallen churches. Actually starts on the last line on page 372 and reads across to page 373. Angels of God were watching with the deepest interest the result of the warning. Now what warning? The chapter is called The Great Religious Awakening. And if you read the entire chapter in context, you'll find that it refers to the presentation of the message by William Miller and his associates. So the warning referred to here is the warning of the first angel or this warning we have back in our board back here. When there was a general rejection of the message by the churches, angels turned away in sadness, but there were many who had not yet been tested in regard to the Advent truth. Many were misled by husbands, wives, parents or children and were made to believe it a sin even to listen to such heresies were taught by the Adventists. So here's another class we have not referred to yet. They're not the wise and foolish who have gone forth. They're not the rejected, but they're the hidden ones. Hidden ones who have been kept from hearing the truth by the ill-advised efforts of husbands, wives, parents, children, ministers, priests and so forth. And in their simplicity and honesty they have believed what these folk have said to them and they have not investigated the living truth of God. In his great love and mercy God has a special means of protection for them. As it now goes on to say, angels were bidden to keep faithful watch over these souls for another light was yet to shine upon them from the, from the throne of God. Isn't that a very beautiful revelation of God's loving care? Beautiful. And right now, out there in the Roman Catholic Church, in the Protestant churches, in the Seventh Avenue Church, and even out there in the world of communism and hedonism, there are thousands upon thousands of people to whom the light of truth has not yet come. It just hasn't reached them. For instance, I'm quite surprised at times to to move around uh, Adventists today and find they know nothing about Wayne, uh, Will and Short 
nothing about um, uh, Bonehouse and Martin, nothing about the changes in Adventist theology. They seem to, be, seem to have been insulated from it all. Never heard about it. Now amongst that class of people, there are honest and faithful ones and angels are keeping faithful guard over every one of them. And, when the, and, and they'll, st they'll stay there in the church in, in many cases. Some will come out in the meantime as they, as they come, become ready for it. But when the loud cry begins, they will then come out by the tens of thousands to join with God's true people. And as you know, of course, from page 390 in the same book, Great Controversy, we find these words written. Page 390, Great Controversy. Notwithstanding the spiritual darkness and alienation from God that exist in the churches which constitute Babylon, the great body of Christ's true followers are still to be found in their communion. There are many of these who have never seen the special truths for this time. Not a few are dissatisfied with their present condition and are longing for clearer light. They look in vain for the, for the image of Christ in the churches with which they are connected. As these bodies depart further and further from the truth and ally themselves more closely with the world, the difference between the two classes will widen and it will finally result in separation. The time will come when those who love God supremely can no longer remain in connection with such as are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. So at the present time, where are the majority of Christ's true followers to, still to be found? Right, in all those fallen churches. We are the advance guard. We are the ones called out ahead to give the call to the rest when the time duly comes. So the simple fact is this then, we have two companies of God's people during this tarrying time, those in the churches hidden away from the light, light of truth so far, who are being prepared by God's Spirit to receive the light which is to come, and those out here who are being prepared to give that light. Now when the time comes that those out here have been prepared, be, been prepared to give it, and those in here are prepared to receive it, then God will release the mighty message of the midnight cry, the loud cry, or latter, the latter rain begins to fall, the loud cry commences, and then thousands upon thousands of folk will come out. Now in the meantime, we don't have to worry about them, because an angel is keeping faithful watch over them, and he's doing a better job than you and I can do. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think you all agree to that. A much, much better job. Now, a good example of this principle of waiting until the time comes, of course, of the ministry of John the Baptist and of Jesus Christ. Now, during the first 30 years of Christ's life, he lived in a world that was simply crying out in desperate, anguished need for salvation. And Jesus Christ could have launched on a very productive and uh, effective ministry at the age of 15, 16, 17, even back at the age of 10 and 12. He could have been, it could have been a, a child preacher and had a tremendous job of preaching the message around Israel. But his time had not yet come, and Jesus left the angels to watch over faithful souls out there in, in the land of Israel while he diligently stayed by his post and prepared for his future work. And this is the great lesson we have to learn. We're all too prone to rush out there and convert the world before we do the work that lies nearest to hand first, namely our own personal individual preparation and the salvation of our children and of our families. Now coming back then to the closing scenes of this drama, we found so far that, um, and I just need to draw the message now, as it is given to the little company, it is then given by them to the foreign churches and reaches the hidden ones not previously reached by the light back here. Now, first of all comes the preaching of the message. What is this always followed by? Persecution. And what is that always followed by? Separation. Separation. Very good. We've read so far about the message being given, now comes the persecution. Page 242. As they harmoniously raised the cry among the different companies, those who rejected the light pushed them and with angry looks scorned and derided them. 
But the angels of God wafted their wings over the persecuted ones, while Satan and his angels were seeking to press their darkness around them to lead them to reject the light from heaven. Now comes separation. Then I heard a voice saying to those who had been pushed into the light, Come out from among them and touch not the unclean. In obedience to this voice, a large number broke the cords which bound them, and leaving the companies that, that were in darkness, joined those who had previously gained their freedom and joyfully united their voices with them. All right then, so now we find that the cry goes forth, Come out of her, my people. Now this cry was not given back here because there's nobody out there to give it. Now there are people outside to give it and they give this cry and in response to that cry between um, August 1844 let's write that date up here and October 22, 1844 50,000 people came out of the churches to take their stand with the little company out here. So this little company began to very rapidly increase in size but remember that the vast majority in that company are foolish virgins. A few wise, less than a hundred it seems in the end, and the vast majority were foolish virgins. And so they came down to the second disappointment, and as we know, this was so crusty and so great that just a few wise virgins survived and all the foolish went flocking back to the churches again from which they had come. The wise went in with the bridegroom to the marriage, the foolish found themselves inadequately supplied with the graces of the Holy Spirit and were unable to bear the test which was brought upon them at that point of time. Now my time is about gone, so I'll just briefly summarise this in the last minute we've got left. Now I think you'll agree that what I put on the board is a very accurate representation of that chapter entitled The Advent Movement Illustrated. The scene in the church when the first angel's message came, the persecution and the separation of two companies moving along, in complete separation from each other, the midnight cry, the final call come out of my people, the response when 50,000 came out, and the second and great disappointment when the, when the bridegroom came to the marriage and the door was shut, the wise virgins in and the foolish virgins out. Our next study period will make an application of this to our present history and will be, that is, that is the second fulfillment where Sister Wise says the parable will be fulfilled again to the very letter and we'll demonstrate that we are actually in the process of fulfilment at the present time. In fact, the very next event is the midnight cry, which is the loud cry given the power of the latter rain. Any questions you, you might like to ask on, on this presentation today? Will you have just uh, wise virgins there in the small group? Up here? Yeah. Mostly. There's... Uh, as most of us, I think, have really got, gotten ourselves a victorious experience. But uh, in the chapter on the shaking, we'll see that there are others who come in during this period, and some who come in don't come in with a living experience. So, but they're in the minority in, during this period. But during the layout, they'll be very much in the majority again. Yes. Uh, 